23rd of September. Ancient Saqqara and Pyramid of Djoser. Upon leaving the Memphis Egypt Mount Rahina Museum, our group bust its way to the Saqqara archaeological site and the stepped pyramid of Djoser. The drive was further into the overly arid desert. A short walk takes the group to the gate of the Saqqara temple. Egyptian vendors are always present at tourist attractions. Before we enter, Bruce Porter and Midu teach us about this important place. Uh, this is Saqqara, which is the necropolis, the city of the dead for Memphis, which is over there. The sun goes down in the west, so they bury people in the west. Sun comes up in the east, that's the, that's the side of the living, this is the side of the dead. Bruce Porter instructs once again about the primordial mound, but in more detail. He tells the Egyptian legend's beginning of creation and how it relates to the Old Testament. The primordial mound is the primeval hillock, the axis mundi, the center of the earth, the navel of the earth. Um, the stone of creation, the world mountain, those are all different words that different cultures call the primordial mound. Now the primordial mound becomes very important because it eventually evolves into what's called the pyramid over here. And it'll be flat on the top. That was an artificial primordial mound, which represented that primordial mound or the primeval hillock, the stone of creation. It's what happened when the waters of creation covered the whole face of the earth. God says, let dry land appear. Waters represent chaos. As soon as the dry land appears, that puts borders and boundaries to that chaos. You have a, a border going around that waters. That primordial mound then becomes an important part because that's where the ancients believe God came down to stand to finish the rest of creation. And as the waters recede, that point becomes continues to be a sacred site, the closest point between heaven and earth. That's where, God re that's where God stands to finish the creation. That's where altars are constructed, and altars are constructed to mimic the primordial mound. That's why the law of the altar in the Old Testament has to be of unhewn stones, water and earth, because it has to represent the creation. We see this concept with Elijah. When Elijah builds the altar on Mount Carmel, if you remember, he builds the altar out of the 12 unhewn stones. Then he digs a trench around it and then not only covers water on the altar and the sacrifice, but fills the trench around it. So you have this altar coming out of this sea of water, representing that primordial mound. And then that's when God comes down to that altar, to that primordial mound, consumes not only the altar and the sacrifice, but even the water that's there. Okay, so every, every primordial mound represents that closest point between the, the heavens and the earth. Even our temples represent that. Now, a mastaba was had sloping sides flat on the top. When they built the first pyramid, this one here, Saqqara, they put a mastaba and then put a smaller mastaba and a smaller mastaba and a smaller mastaba. And then eventually they faced the outside, so it becomes what we consider a pyramid, but it represents the primordial mound, the closest point between heaven and earth. And it's where all three worlds come together. The three worlds are the world of the dead, the world of the living, and the world of the gods. That's where all three worlds come together. That's why our temples, which represent the primordial mound also, our temples, why the living can do work for the dead that's binding in the world of the gods. It's where all three worlds come together. Christ talked about this in the New Testament, Matthew 16. Bruce surprises the group about the small stone, referred to as Petros in the Greek language, which was mentioned by Peter the Apostle in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18. He talks about when he, when he comes to Peter, and we all know the story where, where Christ says, who do men say that I am? And they, you know, they, some say you're Elijah, some say Enoch, and some say, you know, John, you know, they say all different things. And Christ says, Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, thou art the Christ, son of the living God. And then Christ says to Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my father was in heaven. Now we, now that's, that's all well and good, but then we connect, we try and connect the next part to that last part. And it's not, because it's only in one gospel. It's not connected to the last part. The revelation is important. But then Christ says, but I'm going to, he says to Peter, and it's only mentioned in Matthew. It's not mentioned in the other gospel. He says, Peter, you're a small stone. He says, thou art a Petros. This is in the Greek. Thou art a Petros. You're, you're a small stone, like a seer stone. You're a small stone. Thou art a Petrus. Petrus. But upon this Petra, Am I going to build my church? He uses two different words. Upon this Petra, and that Petra 
is that primordial mount. If anybody knows what Christ was talking about, it's Peter. And Peter says, gosh, it's six times in four verses, seven times in four verses in his book. He says that stone is Christ. The keys of the kingdom were given to Peter. He explains how this relates to the pyramids and latter-day temples. And I'm going to give you, Peter, the keys of the kingdom so that you can bind for the living and the dead on earth and have it binding in the world of the gods. So the three worlds come together there. Okay. Now the pyramid represents that coming together of those three worlds. That's why the Pharaoh is always buried underneath the pyramid, not in it, like you're going to see it at um, Giza. But you don't, everybody wants to go into the center pyramid or the center tomb or, or um, chamber up there. But there's always a bottom chamber that goes down underneath, which is actually the burial, just like it is here at Saqqara. But you're buried underneath because that's the closest point to heaven and earth. It's the center of that pyramid, that representing that primordial mound where God comes to stand. And that's what the pyramids represent. And our temples represent the same thing. Brigham Young said no two temples can be constructed alike because they have to represent the creation. Same in purpose, but they can't be constructed exactly like. And he said they can't do that because they have to represent the creation. And to create is not to copy. And every primordial mound, every pyramid represents that closest point between heaven and earth where everybody, where man dies and man res is resurrected. And where creation began, the pyramids, the tops of the pyramids, had what was called the Ben-Ben stone. It was a pyramid shape, the Ben-Ben stone. They believed originated, or the center of the earth was in Heliopolis, where our hotel is. And it was in pyramid shape. They have a Ben-Ben stone in the Egyptian museum that we'll see when we go in there, a black basalt Ben-Ben stone. And so we'll see that, but it represents that primordial mound. This is the oldest stone-constructed temple enclosure in the world. Bruce talks about the crenellated and accretion construction of the temple walls by Imhotep, the architect. Crenellation means it goes out and then it comes in, and it goes out and it comes in. You can see the smaller crenellations along the side, goes out and comes in, but then there's larger crenellations where it comes out, it's crenellated and comes back in and goes back out. So, so you have a double crenellation here. The Mesa Temple is a crenellated temple. The Mesa Temple is the closest to this type of style, and it's, and, it's a, and it's a cube which puts it in the, in the altar range or in a connection of the altar range, the Mesa Temple is. But it's crenellated because that's the way they would do it before they used stone. Now before they used stone, I don't know whether you can see this on the ground, they would use reeds, and the reeds would make an arc, and then that arc would come back the other way, and then it would come the other way again. See, that creates a crenellation. If you know what that is, that gives it sheer strength too, so they would crenellate it. And that's what they would do the very first temples. Even in Mesopotamia, the temple enclosures would be, crenellate, would be crenellated reed walls in order to give it strength and protect people. And so when they, when they were doing that and they constructed the first temple enclosure out of stone, they took that symbol of the crenellated reed walls and did it here in stone. And when the architect, his name was... Imhotep, not from the movie, you remember the mummy movie, Imhotep, Imhotep. Imhotep, Imhotep, Imhotep. <laughs> they get his name from here because but the architect's name was Imhotep. When they, they designed it out of stone, they didn't know if it was going to stand, so they used small stones. And as you go inside here, as you begin to go inside and go through the corridor, you'll see that he built columns out of small stones, but he didn't know if it was going to hold up, so they built retaining little, little stone walls back to hold, hold that up. And then they used stones to imitate the beams. As you walk in, you'll see rounded stones going across. That imitates the beams of the ancient reed and wood temples and the beams that went across. They even have two stone doors in there to represent the stone doors that were once wood and, and reed doors in there. So it's very ancient. Bruce continues talking about the ceremonies of the Pharaoh, the seven blows of life, and the coronation ceremony. Even, even the Pharaoh had to be, before he's buried, after he dies, and after the mummification process, before he's placed into the thing, he has to be anointed okay. seven different times. He has to be anointed with the holy oil on his forehead and his eyes and his nose, his mouth, oh. all the way down to his feet. They call it the seven blows of life because that anointing was an ordinance of the resurrection. And they anointed the body so that those parts of the body would function properly in the resurrection. It's oh. called the opening of the mouth ceremony. Okay. 
Sounds familiar. It's called the initiatory. Well, the initiatory was something else. The, the Pharaoh had to go, be washed. In the coronation ceremony that took place right here, we're gonna, there's a coronation center over here, that the, the king had to fight a ritual combat, and he had to symbolically oh. die. And then the substitute was killed, and he would go into the basement of the temple. And after three days, when all the lights in the land were extinguished for three days, then he would be washed and anointed and receive a new name and put on shoes and robes and then come out after three days. I mean, you could go on and on and on and talk about these things. Abraham talks about it. And what we have over here is very much like what Abraham describes in, in the book of Abraham about the hill Oli Shem, the hill of the sun the hill of Ra, and the obelisk that's there at the hill of Ra. Bruce Porter spent about an hour instructing further. Mido, our guide, teaches the group further about the stepped 2700 BC pyramid of Djoser, which is the oldest known pyramid in the world. Above the ground, which is creating the pyramid shape, which we called it under the name of the step pyramid, because it looks like a steps above each other. There were six steps, and on the top of the six steps, that is the nearest location to go to heaven. So they believe the top of the pyramid, it is where God presents. A, a king of Egypt, he is following the si system of exaltation, as we say before. So the king had to be buried all the way under the ground. And then he goes out from under the ground to follow the connection. That is the gate. That is the nearest connection. That is the only gate between the three different levels of life. So he is being buried under the ground, underworld. And then he will go to the living parts. And then he will go ascending all the way up to be with God in heaven. That's why the statue, we see it in Memphis. He was on the top of the pyramid. That's meaning he already became one and he exalted and became one with God. When he do that, he know the way so people could follow him. So he is a guide. Every king is a guide to guide his people, to guide his nation, to guide the people who believe in him, to lead them all the way up to be with God. One was God all the way up in heaven. The story of this way, that how, how this one here is not a straight line, it's going up and this one is going up. And this one going up. So that is what creates our what our professor is explaining about the first piece of land, the creation, the Bermuda or Mount. And that is the next connection. And in the same moment, it is the gate connecting the three levels of life, all of them together. And that is the gate. So that's why for the ancient Egyptian people who is buried in a pyramid or underneath a pyramid, he have the access to go and exalt and being one with God. When he will be a king, after he got his exaltation, he need to have a palace from where he gonna rule for everlasting life. And that's why Imhotep or Imhotep, which is the engineer who made this wonderful building, and it is the first man-made building made out of a stone related back to 2,700 years ago and still survived until today. I'm not saying it is the first one, it is the oldest one. Because we know that is in Iraq, they have other buildings are exist there like ziggurats. But that is the most preserved one, which is this pyramid and this enclosure wall. So Imhotep would like to imitate the palace of the king to give him a way of coronation. When the king will be coronated in his second life and having his resurrection and he exalted, he need to be in a palace. So that's why they have the palace, the imitation of the palace, which we are gonna see it now. It's time to tour Imhotep's Saqqara Temple. Coming out on the other side of the Saqqara Temple, we enter the large courtyard. Midu teaches us about this location and the setting for the pharaoh's afterlife in locations of the temple and Djoser pyramid rooms. So they are bringing a cow and leave the cow running in this open area. And they give him a robe made out of linen and a flint stone knife. Nothing more, nothing less. And he had to run after the cow and he had to face the cow and he had to hold the cow and tie the cow and push it underneath him and control it. And he ties three legs of the cow together, leaving the left front leg of the cow free. And then he, with the flint knife he has it in his hand, he had to cut the head or slaughter the cow. 
and then he got the front of left leg and he had to carry it in his hand and go running for 42 states shrine and asking gods of the local states of Egypt to approve him. I'm still powerful, I'm still strong, I'm still a good king. I could kill the cow and give it an offering to you. And if he succeed to do that, he will be the king of Egypt back again. And he had to prove himself before they start the coronation. When they start the coronation, if they give him the approval, how he will start the coronation? Starting the coronation by making him die. So he had to be buried under the ground for three days. And during the three days, he had no food supplies, he had nothing with him, and he had to survive. If he survived after three days, he will come out exalting, going out, and then they were gonna wash his body. That is the first one. They were gonna wash his body, and they were gonna give him a white robe, a new dress, a new robe. They were gonna give him a new crown, and they were gonna give him a new shoes. And by this way, he will be ready to go to the next step. First is washing and then giving him the accessories or the dress. And then he will go to the second step. And the second step is he will give him the crown and they will give him the annihilation. Seven drops of oil in seven certain places in his body, which is nowadays we call it the seven chakra. Are you familiar with that? Yes. The seven chakra, which is doors had to be open or gates had to be open. And then when he is ready, he will be connected with God, embracing God. And when he got the embracing, he will be connected with God and acceptance. And then after that, he could be exalting and seated over the throne of Egypt for 30 years. Beneath the step pyramid at Joseph's complex are over 400 rooms connected by tunnels. A main passageway led us down into a labyrinth of smaller tunnels, chambers, galleries, and shafts. The total length of the rooms and tunnels combined is 5.7 kilometers or 3.5 miles. The rooms include the king's burial chamber and a palace to serve as the home for the king's spirit in the afterlife. The great wealth stored in the pyramid demonstrates both the opulence of the king's life on earth and in the next world. The king's burial chamber was accessed through a vertical shaft in the pyramid that was 7 meters or 22.9 feet on each side and reached a depth of 28 meters or 91.8 feet, lined entirely in granite. At the bottom of the shaft was a burial chamber lined with four courses of granite blocks. After the burial, workers lowered a 3.5 ton granite block to obstruct the shaft and prevent future access by robbers. Lowering the 40 ton granite sarcophagus through the 90 foot overhead shaft took another stroke of genius from Imhotep, the architect. He had his workers fill the shaft with sand and place the sarcophagus on top of the pile. Then he released the sand into additional side shafts. The central shaft slowly emptied out, and once all the sand had been completely removed, Zoser's sarcophagus was left standing in the burial chamber, deep beneath the floor of the step pyramid. Our group proceeded to ascend the staircase leading to the southern tomb of King Djoser. It's located in the southern corner of his funerary complex in the Saqqara Antiquities area. In order to venture down this particular location, an additional fee of approximately $100 is now required. The southern tomb consists of two parts. The upper part is lined with a limestone mastaba. The lower part is carved into the plateau bedrock at a depth of about 30 meters or 98 feet. At this point, the stairway leads to a door. Passing through the door, a stone staircase leads to an open area with metal scaffolding type stairs. Steps lead to the bottom of the room, where the massive granite tomb has been reassembled and restored. Walking further would take persons through tunneled halls lined with stone. The walls are carved with facade spaces, containing frescoes decorated with pieces of ceramic made of blue faience, a sintered quartz ceramic material mostly found in Egypt. The stepped pyramid tomb under the Pyramid of Djoser is not accessible to the general public, but one can watch a YouTube documentary by Slice History about the Step Pyramid of Djoser. See link in the description below. Some of us take advantage of being photographed with a few of the local vendors.
At this vantage point, people can see much of the archaeological work in the area. Returning, the buses drive past other structures that are believed to be a cemetery of tombs. Soon our tour leaves the arid land and into the green countryside of Cairo suburbs. We once again drive through Cairo along the canal and see more of life going on with the people of Egypt. Our group goes to the Saqqara restaurant for lunch. At the entrance, a few local women are engaged in the traditional art of bread making using clay ovens. Some of the group purchases their fresh bread. Our group of tourists stayed at the Cairo's Hotel Sonesta for another night. In our next episode, we fly to Luxor, Egypt, and tour the heart of the Egyptian kings. We'll drive through Luxor, and enjoy a sunset dinner on the banks of the Nile. Finishing the day, participate in a carriage ride through the teeming streets of old Luxor. In conclusion, the group takes an evening tour of the magnificent Luxor Temple. We hope you will join us again with Bruce Porter and his epic tour, Gospel on the Nile.